Welcome to the Modern Digital Enterprise, the digital transformation podcast from Annexnet, where we discuss a variety of topics that enterprises grapple with as they modernize and transform their IT and business operations. Today, we're talking with Robbie Paul, a new member of the Annexnet family by way of our recent acquisition of Light Networks. So, Robbie, welcome. Thanks, Glenn. Good to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get into today's topic, which is one that everyone will have a little bit of personal experience with on the customer side at the very least, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Absolutely. I grew up in South Florida and uh, I've been married for almost 28 years. I have two older children who are collegiate and my wife and I are recently experiencing empty nesthood. So we're yeah. traveling a bunch and having fun. Oh, very nice. That's awesome. My daughter is a, a senior in high school and she's going through all the college app stuff. So we're going to be right behind you. Yeah, it's a, uh, it can be a stressful time uh, <laughs> when, you're, when your kids leave the house. <laughs> okay. Uh, so speaking of stressful time, <laughs> there, there's the time when you actually need some help from whatever vendor that you're dealing with, whether it's uh, an airline, a hotel, or just a piece of software that's not working the way that you want. And you got to try and get in touch and get a little bit of help. So today we're going to talk a little bit about call centers, uh, which, you know, again, from the customer side can be kind of stressful and sometimes a little bit annoying. So I, I will try and keep this, you know, more on the rails and not make it like my personal little uh, rants, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. So Robbie, you've been working with enterprises to try and optimize or even radically reinvent their call center operations for years. But before you help us understand like where the opportunities for improvement lie, I, I just want to see if you know, my own personal experiences are representative of a lot of the problems that you commonly find. Stop me if you've ever heard any of this stuff. Let me know if there's stuff that I've missed. I suspect I've heard a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. So number one is the maddening and often excruciatingly long IVR prompts list. Like, so it's, and then having sure. to remember, wait, no, that's actually not what I wanted. The one that I wanted was should the I, one that- Should I wait until the end where I need to, you know, listen to the menu again? Yes, yeah. that's a good one. And then on a related note, the fact that, I don't know how many times you have to actually scream representative into the phone before it actually <laughs> realizes that you want to talk to a human. Yeah. Also related to this is once you've figured out what path that you think you want to go down, very, very long wait times. And of course, as you move across the chain, having to identify yourself with whatever sort of personal information, your little secrets, you know, answers to your question, like, you know, what was your favorite band growing up? Yeah. You know, 700 times, or at least somehow that it feels and then once you actually get to someone, they have no idea any of the information that you've you know, put in before. That's just a couple. Those are all very common and very frustrating. Yeah. I, I guess the good news is, or, or sadly, um, it's, it's really easy to address a lot of that. It requires a little bit of effort and planning and forethought. But you know, the truth is that if you as a company really care about your client and you, know, you want them to have... You know, what we look for is a frictionless experience. And you mentioned the word call center, and it's kind of shifted to contact center over time because truthfully, what we're looking to be able to do is meet our client where they are today. So it may be that I don't want to call you, I want to text you, or I want to chat, or I want to utilize some other medium other than that. I want to use WhatsApp or Apple Business Chat or something along those lines. You know, all those things are capable. And, you know, ideally, you really want to set it up so that as I decide that I need to contact you and gain some level of assistance, that it should be easy for me to do so, that you should probably, it, wh whatever information you have. So I, I think that the world that we live in today, we collect tons of data. You know, da data is not our problem. Our problem is synthesizing the data and doing something with it useful, suggesting that, for example, if Glenn is calling me, Perhaps I should take some of the information I have about him and apply it to predict why might Glenn be calling me and, you know, perhaps offer him something that's useful instead of, instead of making me listen to a bunch of menu prompts and decide which one is it, you know, maybe I'm calling you because Glenn has a flight for today and, uh, you know, are you calling about your flight today? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. And I think certain industries are a little better than others at this. Uh, you know, I think the airlines have, in certain cases, at least the ones that I'm, I've flown more recently, 
they're a little more proactive in approaching that. The secondary one you mentioned, a long wait time. I mean, goodness, you know, we've been in COVID for what, almost two years now. Please don't tell me that, you know, we're experiencing unusually high call volumes. <laughs> no, you're not. You just haven't really decided how to staff well, or you haven't implemented the technology to allow me to save my place in line. This is very simple. Put in place the technology and respect my time. Those, those seem to me... Those are kind of simple ones to me where you look at it, it's not hard to implement that. And by the way, the, the technology actually pays for itself. Instead of paying a per minute rate for me to sit on hold, frustrate me and pay for long distance rates while I'm sitting on hold waiting for your rep to be available. Why not just take the time and call me back when you're ready? Yeah. No, all no, those no. things are very common. Yeah, no, and all those are good because actually the the first thing that you said of trying to use the data that we have to understand the context of why I might be calling. Even if it's not why, at least it looks like you actually know who I am and value sure. me perhaps as a customer. Wouldn't that be nice? But it, it reminds me of a quote from Benedict Evans, who is an industry analyst. He talked about, and I'm going to butcher the quote a little bit, but it's basically like a computer should never ask a person a question that it should be able to reason out by itself. Yeah. So it's like, if I have sure. all this information, like I know who you are, I can look at your reservation status and see that you are flying today that you know, to your point, it's pretty good chance. That might be why I'm calling. Well, it's interesting too. you know, one of the things that's, that's common. So, you know, I think that what a lot of people don't understand, or maybe they do inherently understand is that organizations are trying to reduce the cost of handling a call. And in so doing, they're trying to automate certain tasks that should be simple, but depending on the, the mechanism that you use to do that, it can be a positive customer experience or a frustrating one. And the other thing to realize is that despite your very best efforts to automate these things, close to the industry statistic is somewhere between 35 and 40% of any sort of digital interaction ends with a requirement that I have to talk to a human. If I have to talk to a human, now I'm transferring medium. And here's where it gets really frustrating is that I've spent time in your IVR. I've given some level of information. I realize that I cannot solve my problem. Now I need to talk to an agent. In your example, you're saying representative. Oh, I, <laughs> I, say, say, that, I say that much right. louder. Yes, just yes. so you know. And angrier. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting, by the way, you can actually, depending on the platform you're on, you can listen for sentiment, how frustrated is your caller, not just, not just to a live agent, but you can actually listen to it during the IVR. Just interesting point, sidebar note. But as you transfer out to this agent, now there's this whole question of, am I transferring the context of the original call? You know, have I already authenticated to the IVR? If I have, can you, can you authenticate me to the agent? Here's the thing. A lot of organizations, they're utilizing disparate systems. And when they're doing that, they're not properly networked or they don't have the capability to be networked at all. So you have the separate siloed application as opposed to working with a complete tech stack that is all integrated that would allow you to gracefully transfer from one medium to the next and potentially back. So think about it this way. What if I transfer to the agent they actually know who you are. You're already authenticated. They help you with your thing. And they say, hey, would you like me to text you that information? Yeah, that'd be awesome because I'm on the road. And then I can look at it later. So those are all things that you can do, but you have to spend the time up front identifying what is it that we're trying to solve for and really spend the time evaluating my current environment. And a lot of the, a lot of the engagements that we start with, you know, we're, we're an engineering led company, as you know. And a lot of that starts with a strategic kind of discovery session that says, what, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And once we have our, where, where are we headed to? Let's identify where we are and what's the gap between the two. And then how do we tactically plan to get from where we are to where we want to be? And that's how all the engagements that we work through in the contact center space work. And I know that's similar in some of our other environments. Yeah. So everything that you said makes total logical sense to me. The issues, I think, are all well understood. The paths to trying to address some of those issues seem fairly, you know, like, like I said, logical, straightforward. But the, the same problems have existed 
you know, at contact centers for decades. What is it, you know, and even starting with the strategy, as you talked about, what has to happen that you've seen typically to get whoever's in charge of that group to recognize that there's enough of a problem to do something different and to start to engage with someone like yourself and, and build an actual strategy about how do we improve our operations? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a fair question. I, I think that for years, the contact center was, was largely viewed as a cost center. And I think that's just shifting. If you believe what you read, the average consumer now values a customer experience above all else. And they are choosing to be loyal to brands that are, you know, respectful of them, that they enjoy doing business with. And if they enjoy doing business with them, then they will continue to purvey and, and promote that brand and really be a brand promoter. So, you know, there's a, your, your, your mecca in the marketing world is, you know, I don't just want, I don't just want a loyal customer. I, I want a customer that's going to scream from the hilltops about what a great experience it was. And that's really what we're looking for. So I think to some extent, there's been a bit of a shift just kind of culturally as to what's important. And I think that's part of what's driving this. So I, I, I think that, that that's a lot of it, Glenn. I, I just okay. think that we're seeing a shift culturally as to, as to what's driving the importance. I think it's less, you know, while cost is still important, I think people are recognizing that, you know, the, the sales opportunity really comes when I come back and I reach to you for customer service and I have an amazing customer service experience, I'm going to tell other people about that. And that's going to make people want to do business with that company. So a lot of the companies that we revere today are the ones that are really pleasant to do business with. When you're working with clients and helping kind of build this case, you said that the ROI, like it generally pays for itself very quickly. When you guys are looking at that, is it just on the cost side, because you said like a lot of these started at, at least started as cost centers, but, or is there a little bit more of an emphasis now, it sounds like on TCV of a customer net promoter score for those who are like screaming from the mountaintops about how great that uh, experience was. When you get into uh, any of these engagements, ultimately they're still going to look at this, you know, in a strict dollars and cents standpoint. And it's hard to put dollars and cents to an increased net promoter score, really. So uh, most of the time, the marketing we're folks building, that. I know, I know, yeah, it's I mean, true. <laughs> but, you know, uh, at least when I'm talking with a CFO, it tends to be focused in and around things like uh, efficiency modeling. So a lot of folks are still operating on an older premise model system that is handling something that's been handling their inbound customer service calls for 20 years, to your point. They haven't really made any grandiose change. And a lot of people you know, have taken the time to say, hey, listen, we're going to, we're going to upgrade and modernize our, our application stack. And then the only thing that they did is they basically picked it up and moved it from one platform to another, and they didn't change anything. And what we're trying to encourage our customers to do is to really think about it, ideate and innovate in their customer service experience or sales experience, because this is not all strictly inbound, it's outbound as well. But right. ultimately, as you're interfacing with your client or prospect, how can we do a better job, make it frictionless? What can we do differently? As you're doing that, what we're finding is that people have not done a very good job of increasing the efficiency of the agent. So that could engage anything from tying your call processing system to your system of record, whether that be a salesforce.com or a Dynamics or Zendesk or any, any one of those you know, enterprise applications, ServiceNow as an example, any of those. Tying those together, you can start to drive efficiency at the agent level and pull, you know, and it sounds silly, but you start to measure this in seconds. Well, if you're a larger organization handling millions and millions and millions of calls, that really starts to add up and it really offsets the overall investment in the technology of what you're utilizing to do that. And these are just basic things. We haven't really gotten into anything fancy yet where, you know, what about the ability to really do some coaching for your agents? So we can evaluate, we, we typically would recommend, so historically people would record all their calls and they would randomly choose five to 10% to evaluate from a QA standpoint. Sure. How do you know you got the right five to 10%? I mean, you just did a random sample. Wouldn't it be better if I said, hey, I want to review all the calls that referenced a particular product. Or, you know, that the client said something, you know, X, Y, or Z, or I want to sample calls where 
I want to see any calls where we didn't read a particular disclosure. All of those things you can do because we can record all of the calls now and you can do scientific sampling. And I don't mean scientific like meaning randomized. I mean scientific like saying, I want to be explicit and prescriptive about what is it that I want to, that I want to look at and then identify, did the rep do a good job or not? Was the, you know, was the customer frustrated? Were they happy? And you can identify based on the words they use, the tone, the volume, like you said, if I yelled representative, I'm upset. If I speak quickly, I'm upset. If I have a regular tone and pace, maybe I'm not. And you start to evaluate and say, hey, these are the calls that I want to investigate. And these are the ones that we're going to utilize to actually coach our agents, things like that. There's a lot that we can do that will really help in uh, kind of improving the overall customer experience. That's one. Uh, one of the other things is that uh, workforce management is uh, a lot of people are managing their contact center staff on a spreadsheet. For right or wrong, there's a, it, there is a way to do it, but it's not terribly effective at modeling. So what we do is we utilize applications that allow us to take historical trending volumes for that organization and then predict out forecasting models that say, hey, based on the, the traditional cyclicality of your business, you know, we believe that, hey, if you're in retail, and then some of these are obvious, right? So I know that the traditional retailer e-tailers are going to be crushed in the latter half of the year, right? And then they're going to be super light in, you know, Q2, Q3. Most businesses have some level of cyclicality, and that starts to reveal itself as you start to feed that historical data in. And you can get more accurate with your staffing models to make sure that you don't have, who guessed it, excessively long hold times. So all stuff that we focus in on. Right. Now, that last example seems pretty obvious. You know, like you said, like if you're a retailer, you know, the Christmas season is clearly going to be, you know, the, the time you're going you're gonna to get your most calls. Just like I would think that for most businesses, my call volume during the day is going to be a lot higher than it is at three o'clock in the morning. So a lot of these staffing things that, that you refer to seem pretty dead obvious. Like why, why are the, you know, I, I, whether yeah. or not you're, you're using an Excel spreadsheet or an abacus, it seems like some of those shouldn't be such a surprise to people. Yeah. I don't know that it's a surprise so much as uh, the applications have come a long way over the last several years, uh, they're very advanced and they've also come down from a accessibility standpoint. Historically, they were something that made sense for someone with maybe a three to 500 agent population and above. And the cost of those have come down considerably making them accessible to you know, smaller contact centers that you know, may not have been able to afford them previously. So the, that's, that's probably the, the simplest of that. I, I don't think that it's a surprise to anybody that if you had a system that was uh, you know, capable of doing forecast modeling, it would be better than guessing. Having it in there and then making sure that all that call volume is integrated into your call processing system, all those things are, are important. Also, what you're talking about in terms of providing the coaching and such and, and the 20-year-old systems that people have been working on that are you know, then historically on-premise as opposed to in the cloud, how much of sort of the lift from just doing things better is based on identifying new processes or creating some of those coaching tools, or are there limitations of, you know, because it's a 20 year old system, you know, which granted there have been release after release after release over the years to enhance that. Is it just that people aren't getting enough out of the tools that they have because they haven't been thinking about it kind of the right way or is it that some of these newer, maybe the cloud-based tools just have, new capabilities that weren't available previously? Well, I mean, it's probably a combination of both. The, the, the thing that a lot of people don't recognize with a premise-based system is that, and I don't want to utilize it in individual vendor names, but you know, call it brand X is a call processing system. It is a limited system and it does a certain set of things. And then in order to support the business requirement, businesses started building adjacent technologies and bolting them on to the call processing system. So it's not uncommon for a premise-based system to be really a conglomerate of eight to 10 different applications that are all tied together. And if you want to upgrade them, and by the way, they're all provided by different companies. So if you want to upgrade something, 
you need to upgrade all of them in a particular sequence. Because if you upgrade one without upgrading the other, then you break that connection and you're no longer able to QA your calls, as an example, or you're not able to record, or you're not able to do, you know, send out post-call surveys or whatever it is that you might be doing. So the process of upgrading a premise-based application becomes very complex and very expensive. So to some extent, I believe there's a there's there's an undercurrent that is uh, really it's lagging technology because it's so difficult and painful and expensive to upgrade. Secondarily, all of these providers have been investing all of their dollars into their cloud-based platforms because it's easier to upgrade them, keep them upgraded, and they upgrade the platform for you over time so that you can simply ingest and utilize those newer features as they come along. So, you know, is it, I don't know that it's exactly because it was, they're premise-based, but, you know, to some extent, I, I think that the advent of cloud technologies and the way that they're implemented does kind of lend itself to a, to an easier onboarding of newer technologies that you can take advantage of. And, and so along the same lines, because integration seems to be yeah, what you were describing, a primary challenge, because there are so many different systems that are part of the overall solution. Are the cloud systems just inherently because maybe they've embraced you know, API or they're investing more in building out their API as to the different systems that that if you had to make those upgrades that enhancing the integration all across that chain is easier? Or is it that they're now building in some of those other well, features that used to be a separate system into- Yeah, the, yeah it's the, really they're built as a single stack. So if you go back five or six years ago, maybe a little bit longer, the, the initial cloud implementations were very much like a premise-based implementation, except it was in cloud. So think of it as like a co-located environment and they would take care of the upgrade for you. What has happened over the last six, seven years is those applications have been rewritten in a microservices architecture approach, meaning I now have all of these things that are pre, pre-integrated and they can be upgraded in sequence at the time that they want without impacting you know, other things that are happening within the application stack. So the answer is it's really a full stack uh, when you look at it, it, include, it includes all of the features that you're thinking about or that you know, the business would require that used to be provided by different providers are now part of a single application stack that you would consume on a you know, usage basis. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. So I just want to kind of go into a couple of other you know, areas that there's opportunity for improvement. And one that you talked about a little bit before was, you know, omni-channel and sort of meeting the customer, you know, where they are, whether it's over iMessage or WhatsApp or, you know, some, some other channel. Let me just say that again, I'm going to go from my personal experience. There was a time, you know, recently, you know, we were flying in an airline. There was my, my, for whatever reason, my wife's known traveler, number didn't make it into, yeah, didn't stick in the reservation, even though my daughter's and mine, were, were, everything was there. And so when I went to call, yeah, they were like, it's a 10 hour wait. So I went to the chat, you know, on my mobile device, which ended up going over to, yeah, the Apple business chat to resolve that. I don't know, in maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Now, how much of it is meeting me where I want to be versus is there a move to try and push people towards other methods rather than making the phone call? Well, that, that's, that's organization by organization. I'll say this, the, uh, you know, so as an example, a chat agent can typically handle a good one on average, let's say four chat streams at a time. And a call is very much one-to-one. Sure. So when you think about the efficiency of the agent and the ability to take on and ingest a number of different things at the same time, chat is far more efficient, allowing them to service more requests in a shorter period of time. I'd tell you, I'd be lying if people don't want to limit voice-based interaction based on what I hear. You know, as I talk with clients, they want to push digital. I think they want to push digital because they feel like that's the way the average customer wants to be serviced. But I think that you'll find that there are some organizations who want to push digital at all cost and good luck finding a telephone number to call them, right? There are oh, yeah. others who, you know, no examples, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, the, <laughs> but it, you know, there are some organizations who push it as that first and then they're, if they're good at it, 
they offer you a path to a live agent if it's a requirement. And I think that those are the organizations that are going to serve, you know, the customer need the best and, you know, where you're going to have the, the best experience overall. And, you know, again, I don't favor organizations that force me down a digital route and there's no way to call them. Sometimes you need to call. By the way, what if you're driving? Let's say I'm driving because, you know, I spend a lot of time, you know, traveling. If I have to wait until when, maybe after hours when I can sit still and, and you know, do a digital interaction, what if they're not on anymore? Now what? So I think uh, a mix is ideal, but I do think that there's de a definitively a trend to push more and more digital. And if you think about it, all of those, you know, requests, anytime they're reaching out to you, they started somewhere on the web, most likely. At the very least, they had to look up your number from Google or from whatever their preferred browser is. So yeah, I, I think uh, you'll definitely continue to see a trend towards that. I think that voice utilization has probably been stable where it's been predicted it'll decline. I think what's happening is the mix is changing where we're seeing more and more digital come in, but I think that the call volume seems to be somewhat stable, maybe declining a little bit, but uh, it's the digital that's you know really rising. Is where do you see like intelligent assistants, which sometimes are uh, not so intelligent, not, 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 not so intelligent. Yeah. Not any better than, <laughs> than, than IVR, but you know, that technology is certainly getting better. There are some newer vendors, yeah. you know, on the scene, which seem like they I think have it a holds, more promise. I think it holds a tremendous amount of promise. So here, here's the thing. And I'm sure you've done a podcast with Greg Tinker before and, you know, Greg heads up our automation practice and really all those automation practices are about creating an inference engine that you feed enough data into it that it can make a reasonable guess as to why it is, you know, what it is you're saying or what it is you're asking for to provide a response. I think that what the contact center industry in general is trying to do is take, um, if you view the holistic number of, of contacts that someone you know reaches into a center um, and you and you organize them into a triangle with the largest volume of them being at the bottom of the triangle those are your simple tasks and at the very tip of the triangle those are the ones that are the most complex and the most complex can only be handled by a human those are your highest value you know toughest to handle requirements the bottom half are the ones that can typically be handled self-service in an IVR and if you have a well-designed, uh, what we'll, we'll call a conversational IVR, something that I can talk to it, it understands me, and it can easily do that. Or it even, you know, to our earlier, dis earlier discussion, predicts why I was calling and offers me a solution before I've even had to ask. Awesome. Simplest ones out of the way. The ones in the middle, I think, are where we're really looking to apply that technology. And I think where you're going to see it happen first is in an agent assist model, where the agent is on the call, but there is a, you know, I'm going to call it AI. AI is, again, nothing more than an inference engine that's, that's listening in or, you know, reading text or doing something that says, hey, because you said this, and it may be through guided menus that says, hey, ask the customer these three things. If they say number one or number two, then the, then the potential answer are one of these three things. Is this what you're looking for? I believe that it's going to continue to get better as our compute processing costs come down, as the inference engines grow in uh, complexity and maturity, you're going to find that they're going to be more adept at offering the agent what you need. And at some point, you'll find that the agent begins to be extracted from the conversation and you can actually have an unattended chatbot that does a really good job. So over time, I think that what we'll do is crawl up the stack so that you're seeing, uh, you know, slightly more and slightly more complex issues being solved through uh, some level of automation. That, that's where I think that that's all going to head. Yeah. And the, the assisted uh, style that you talked about, that's basically where you've got systems that have like ne next best action. That's something Correct. you have to say very slowly because that, yes. uh, though I stumble on that phrase, but. Yeah, next best, next, oh, now I got it too. It's catching. Um, <laughs> next best action is, uh, I think that is something that everybody is really driving for and what they really want. It's all dependent on real-time transcription. So you got to be able to ingest the call, real-time transcribe it, evaluate it, and make a recommendation. You can do it that way, or you can do guided questions. So that's sort of the same kind of, con you know, conceptually, it's the same thing. Really what we're trying to do is we're trying to take 
context from our conversation, Glenn said this, he likes the color blue. Awesome. Because you like blue, you probably like X, Y, or Z. Would you like to look at this if I'm in a sales scenario? Or I'm troubleshooting a problem and uh, he said X, Y, or Z, you know, have we considered or have we started to kind of go down this path? And those are really, you know, ultimately we're taking context from a conversation and applying knowledge to that. And how do we do that? That's through, you know, ultimately evaluating the data that we've collected over time. So again, we're back to data. So we're constantly collecting data. We need to be feeding that data into an engine that allows us to appropriately define what is it and why are they calling? What's the possible solution and presenting those things quickly. And the better that those engines get, the less likely you require a human and human interaction. And right now, I think that we're very early in the industry. So people, you know, they see it doesn't always work perfectly because the engines aren't mature enough. And, you know, and by the way, another quote that I, that I uh, think about uh, when you said it all comes down to data is uh, when I took a Six Sigma class, the guy said, you know, in God, we trust all others must bring data. Um, so <laughs> Love it. Stuck, stuck with me and it's been about 15 years. So it's, uh, you know, it's a good one. Well, there's, uh, there's the, the three, the three types of liars or uh, statisticians, lawyers, and politicians, uh, you know, they're all utilizing data. So what you do with the data is important. I had a customer describe to me big data as the dog chasing the car and he actually catches the car by the bumper. Now, what does he do? Right. You know, the real thing is, okay, I've got all this data. How do, how do I synthesize it into something useful that I can help my customer with and I can drive my business forward and I can create actionable insights out of it? That's the magic. I, I see that we're, we're coming up on time. Yeah, I, I will say that, yeah, there's obviously a lot more to cover. I'm sure we'll have other sure. conversations. You have given me hope, going back to my beginning about my rant, yeah, that, uh, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel that is not an oncoming train as it comes to contact centers and that there's a lot of opportunity for enterprises out there to get a lot better. So um, anyone listening here who also agrees with me, definitely need to give Robbie a call, but I really appreciate your time. I'll give you a chance if you have any kind of last suggestions or guidance to people before we go, you know, have at it. Uh, just that, you know, we're, we're passionate about improving the overall customer experience. And, and really that starts with a conversation about what are you doing today? And let's talk about what's available and how we can make it better. And that's really where that conversation starts. So if you're interested in attracting new clients and retaining existing ones, and you haven't started to really contemplate what your overall customer experience is, you need to start now because this is how the world is going to compete over the next decade. That's awesome. It's a great way to end. Robbie, thanks again. It's been a pleasure and we'll chat soon. Absolutely. Anyone else out there in podcast land, we'll talk to you soon too.